Coming up on FRC Recap, Tyler Vanessa is the programming guru. He's here to talk pro tips for your team and his involvement in the WPI library and more. We'll uncover new potential plans for 2021 competition. And while there's some interesting ones out there, a new vision system offers promise to the future and we'll provide our community spotlight and play Take From Front Trivia. All this and more coming up on FRC Recap. Giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archive first robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And also, viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to FRC Recap, where you get the latest breakdowns and discussions and what's going on in FRC. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Tyler Olds. And I'm Marshall Massingill. Uh, so today we're going to uh, be covering a, a bunch of awesome things with our guest, uh, Tyler Vaness, who's a WPI Lib contributor and a mentor for Team 3512. Welcome to the show, Tyler. Thanks for being, uh, glad to be here. Yeah, man. So lots to cover, of course. Let's jump right into our headlines. Uh, starting out on here, uh, we have some interesting news to cover. Uh, Fun has received some public and some not so public information uh, from sources showing the potential options for the 2021 FRC season in regards to competition play. Uh, we'll be talking a lot more about this in our additional discussions coming up here, but uh, starting out uh, from Chesapeake, there's a town hall offering a few options that were presented, uh, including smaller one day events uh, with smaller teams and no spectators. Uh, and we've also heard as well too that there's potential for a remote skills type competition, uh, similarly to what could be potentially from Vex. Uh, I'm going to guess that at first does it they call it something different uh, than skills competitions. That's my guess on there. Uh, but ones that are virtually refereed uh, and have, uh, of course, much more social distancing and even game announced remotely as well too. Um, interesting to see how bandwidth will be uh, with all these people connecting in for live events in random uh, locations, uh, of course. And then one other one that I thought was very interesting was limiting where teams can travel in distance uh, and almost creating many districts amongst regional areas. So uh, a lot of districts are pretty well self-contained or at least amongst a couple states, but it could also be similar for states as well too. Uh, this would be uh, an example for teams to only compete within their state, of course, or, or within a certain mile radius. So we're very interested to talk more about this uh, during Let's Discuss That, and we'll talk about that a bit more. Marshall? Yep. So uh, talking about headlines, the other big one that I think everybody's been talking about, at least in my circles, has been this Glowworm uh, vision system that's come out. So uh, it's finally a competitor to the limelight uh, that looks legit. Uh, it's got bright green lights, so check the box there. It's got a Raspberry Pi compute module, so we can check that box too, uh, and a camera. And uh, I don't know, what more could you ask for? <laughs> so uh, Tyler? Yeah, um, so for WPI Lab, because I'm one of the developers, uh, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming down the pipeline. And uh, as you guys know, COVID's been you know shutting down all kinds of events and we're replaying last year's game. But we still have a lot of cool features that don't really impact a lot of the old stuff. So we want to get that shipped out to users like it's, it, like when it's available so teams can play with it before kickoff. So we're planning on doing some, uh, if you might remember the alpha releases we did a couple years ago, we're going to do something similar to that with our new features. So lots of cool stuff for that. And we'll be talking, of course, more with Tyler, uh, getting more in depth in regards to uh, programming WPI Lab and a lot more coming up later on as well. Um, of course, uh, sad and unfortunate news last night. Uh, if you haven't heard, uh, and it's been pretty much everywhere, uh, Mythbusters host, and uh, just general overall amazing guy. He's been, of course, in BattleBots, a first uh, mentor as well, too. Uh, Grant Imahara has died, uh, passed away last night from a brain aneurysm. 
And wow, I mean, I was pretty shocked when I heard this all this late last night. Uh, very active in the first community, obviously, as a mentor with Team 841, the Biomex out of California, uh, and also helped out with Fertase Q, creating some uh, different videos uh, out there as well. You can uh, check those out. We have the videos uh, posted on Fund's uh, social media. Uh, but, you know, huge impact, of course, to the community, uh, both for, you know, first BattleBots, the entire engineering community as a whole, those who love Mythbusters and the White Rabbit Project, which I think I watched one episode of. Uh, but, of course, his impact uh, will be missed, uh, and I, I can't. Uh, it's been a been a weird weird day uh, just hearing about that. Tyler Marshall, any thoughts on uh, Grant's passing? Um, definitely uh, somebody who is inspirational, I think, to a lot of folks in the FRC community, um, not just FRC, but BattleBots as well, and just robotics and kind of making things and uh, in general. So definitely hits hard. Um, I don't really, I, I to be honest, I haven't completely processed it yet. So, yeah, I would agree. Neither have I, because I remember, <clears throat> I remember growing up on like Grant with MythBusters, you know. Yeah. And like he's doing all kinds of robotics stuff because it's like what he used to do at ILM, you know. Yeah. It's, it's been. I think it's been interesting for me, like seeing the news stories today. I feel like my feed was kind of inundated uh, with lots of information about this, and I didn't realize the extent of everything he had been involved in throughout his kind of life and career. So I think seeing a lot of that's been interesting to me. Can we get some Fs in chat for Grant, by the way? Let's get a nice little F train going on. Pay some respects to Grant uh, as we move on with our headlines. Yeah. So uh, I think outside of that, the other uh, big article that uh, kind of came out this past week and past couple weeks uh, has been the uh, notion of attendance tracking. Lots and lots of people are suddenly asking about it. Uh, I don't really know why, to be honest, but they're asking, <laughs> um, which is good. Uh, so, I, and I'll, I'll get more to that in a second, but uh, just so everybody's aware, uh, Team 900 has one of these. We've been doing it for quite a while now. Uh, we started attendance tracking, I don't know, many years ago. So ours is out on GitHub uh, on our FRC 900 account. Um, anybody's welcome to use that. It's open source. We actually have a new version that isn't out there right now, uh, I don't think, uh, but it should be before too long. We've been trying to add a bunch of things like achievements and multiple teams and multiple schools that we previously didn't support because we suddenly have a lot more people sharing our lab, or at least we have uh, this past year. Um, there's also a really cool one from 6328 that does tracking based on phones and whether the phone is in the environment or not, which I think is really cool. I think it has to be connected to an AP. I don't really know the full details, um, but I just thought it was a neat idea. I might steal that for some of the stuff we're doing too, so it's kind of cool. And then 5190's got a really good one as well that I liked. Uh, so Tyler, what does your team do for attendance tracking? Well, we do the uh, old-fashioned paper approach. Yeah. I mean, it works. I mean, yeah, because we looked at that that one that monitored the AP traffic, and turns out you don't actually have to connect to the AP for it to work. Ah. But in our case, we got people moving back and forth between rooms a lot, so you have to be within range of it for, for a little bit for it to pick you up. Yeah, we were we were thinking about it, and the, the biggest issue we've got is we have students that live on campus, so uh, they're in range oh. of it no matter what. Oh. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't doesn't work that well for us for for tracking students. It might work for mentors. So we were talking about it. Maybe we could implement it that way. Um, so I do think, uh, it, as a point of note, uh, something that I think is important when we're talking about all these and talking about uh, first in the age of COVID, uh, these attendance tracking systems can double as contact tracing, a uh, very basic Ooh. form of contact tracing. Interesting. So if you are going to implement one, or if you needed an excuse to implement one, perhaps that's it. So which I think is kind of cool. So what's next, Tyler? Well, uh, well, there is some interesting news outside of FRC. For the low, low price of $114,000, you too could have owned an early version of the original unopened Super Mario Brothers game. So WADA certified at 9.4. This A-plus condition game was one of the many that sold at auction. Uh, other games include Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, yeah. Uh, sold for fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> so uh, the other Tyler and Marshall, if you had to pick one game, video game to buy, no matter the cost, what would it be? So uh, I'm going to go with an arcade game. And it's going to be very obscure, and I should I should have prepped this ahead of time. But when I was a kid, <laughs> I used to play. Uh, I'm going to see if I can find it. So there's an arcade game called T-Mech, which yeah, let's see if I got it here. I'm going to bring it up on picture. I... It was this huge like yeah, yeah, console yeah. thing. 
Let me bring it up here. And you would you would essentially be a battle mech going around an arena and firing. But the the picture that's shown in the upper right here is a is a two person seater essentially, and you could essentially play over network play uh, with other through intranet ones for other team X stations that were in there. And I think they made it for the sake of 32 X as well. So if I had to pick, if I had a huge, uh, huge amount of space, that's what I'd go with. How about you, Marshall? Oh man, that's a tough one. Uh, I definitely like that idea of like going outside the box of normal, uh, video games, going to something that's arcade based. Like one of the classic star Wars arcade machines would be fantastic Ooh. for me. Um, but I think, the one that I and I in fact I do own a copy of it's the original Sam and Max game from Lucas Arts. Uh, I'm just a big fan. I've uh, been doing that for a long time. So that's those 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 are my games, man. I really enjoyed them. Uh, I wish the studio that was remaking them was still around and still making them. Hoping one day they'll come back again. So there you go, Tyler. Anything for you? Oh. The age of those video games is like before my time, but I would say that the earliest one I've played is Pole Position. Yes. Ooh, yeah. That was my dad's yeah. favorite game for the arcade, honestly. That's that's yeah, a great cool. that's a great I love that I love that we're all choosing like classic retros that are that are older than uh, pretty much everybody alive that's watching this show but <laughs> uh, we'd love to see uh, in chat uh, what you play as well uh, Dan's man always says too young for arcade machines do you not have any like Dave and Buster's around you like there are arcades are still are still alive and well kind of unless you're Chuck E Cheese then you're not doing very well but. <laughs> I feel as an adult, I'd feel weird going there anyway. So, and my kid's only seven months, so I don't think I qualify yet to bring her to that. So, <laughs> no doubt. All right. So, so uh, if you're looking for something to do, uh, by the way, this summer, uh, and, oh, you know what, Marshall? I feel so bad. I, I just want to play this in the background. Oh, I think we need to play this. Can you ex can you explain what this is as we're playing some music here? So one of my students, the amazing uh, Olivia Fujikawa, who's off to do awesome stuff in the fall, uh, Olivia spent part of her summer uh, working on making Falcons play music, which for us is a bit of an ordeal, uh, more so than it might be for other teams because of our use of ROS. So we had to add a whole new motor control mode to our, uh, to our system. So she created some YouTube videos to show this off. The commits uh, in Git for actually pushing this into the main branch just got merged in, and they've been doing reviews actually for the last 24 hours, uh, trying to get all the bits merged in. So we, we're hoping that uh, the next time we play at an event, we'll, we'll get some music uh, going on the robot as well. There so. you go. I, meant, I meant to play this as we were talking. I totally blanked that. But the link is in chat uh, if you would like to uh, check it out in Team 900's uh, Super Mario Brothers theme on Talons. <laughs> there's there's a whole uh, playlist. Uh, I recommend ACDC's Black and Black, personally, and then the uh, Star Wars cantina theme song is another good one <laughs> So. Awesome. So love it. All right. So if you're looking for something to do uh, this summer, uh, first alumni, uh, Ryan Swanson posted an interesting opportunity to get involved with some drones. And this really uh, took my uh, interest because I just purchased a uh, DJI Mavic Air 2. Uh, and I'm starting to love drones, man. Like there's some cool stuff you can do with it. Uh, so Ryan posted that there's on CD and a bunch of social places as well, too. Uh, an interesting uh, concept for a drone competition um, that he's going to be looking to sell kits for. Uh, so you can check out the link of this on Chief Delphi or not. Uh, but essentially, uh, there's a drone challenge where he's going to be giving away some gift cards uh, to the top 10% of submissions on there. Uh, there's a cool drone challenge video, which we'll show. Uh, and you can... Uh, Get a, points for just doing a bunch of cool different tricks and flips and that sort of thing. I, I love this concept. Something you can do uh, at home and something that, uh, you know, you could uh, share with uh, friends. Like, if you don't want to all be in the same place, you could probably take this down pretty easy, send it to the next person, and uh, see how your friends do. So if you don't want, want to all go out and buy, you know, 170 bucks or whatever, which I think is fairly reasonable, but uh, kind of a cool competition. So shout out to Ryan uh, for coming up with this, and uh, I, I really wish him good luck. I'm totally into this. I think this is really cool stuff. So I don't know, Marshall, Tyler, you guys play with drones at all or anything like that? Uh, I used to have a DJI drone. I think it was one of their second generation ones. Sure. So I got that a couple of years ago. I was flying that all around the neighborhood. So yeah, I I uh, I don't really have much in the experience of it outside of like the cheap crappy ones, probably pretty similar to these, the the little tiny mm -hmm. uh, dinky things. But uh, I will mention that Ryan has been working his tail off on this thing for a while, and he's been getting some ideas from others. In fact, uh, he and I have chatted a few times about it, oh, and how sweet. to make it work. So uh, honestly. 
hats off to him. He's done an amazing job with it. I think other teams should check it out. It's something that uh, we were talking about. We, we occasionally do a Boy Scout Merit Badge College, which unfortunately right now with circumstances being what they are, things are kind of on hold for that. Uh, I think this would fit really well with that um, because it's such an approachable challenge for students to kind of uh, get into and get involved in. So honestly, I give it a look if, you, if you're into that kind of thing or looking for that right now. It's definitely something that's worthwhile. All right, and that is going to be our headlines. So let's hop into Let's Discuss That. We'll talk a bit more about uh, some of the couple of topics that we had uh, here today. So, Marshall, let's uh, talk more about the glow worm. Yeah, man. Um, so right off, uh, I, I'm kind of in love with this thing. Uh, it's bringing the, the price of vision, uh, competitive vision system for FRC, kind of an all-in-one system down quite a bit. I know that the WPI Lib folks have been not working their tails off on a Vision uh, uh, Raspberry Pi image for quite some time. Um, I, I, I want to ask Tyler more about that because I think it's going to kind of dovetail into where the glow worm's going. I love that it's open source. I love that they're being very upfront about, I mean, literally the, the chief post, they've been posting back and forth about, well, we're changing the place of this thing and we're going to move it over here now. And oh, by the way, we've moved that over here. So I love that there's this collaborative effort that's going on and people are kind of making inroads into the space and doing some real work around it. Um, I'm excited to see them sell it. I'm excited to see that it's 3D printed cases that are going to be sold with it. I think this is an extraordinary market opportunity for these guys. And I don't know. I wish them the best of luck with it and can't wait to see uh, hopefully teams having this on their robot before too long. So Tyler, I know that WPI Lab's working on it. I want to get your thoughts about the glow worm and then, I don't know, kind of... How, did, how does WPI Lib see the space evolving, maybe, and what are they doing in it right now? Oh, I'm pretty excited about the glow worm because, uh, like, like, like never before, like we've had all this collaboration, like on the FRC Discord with these like former like students, and they're actually trying to starting to make products, and, like, democratize like vision solutions. Yeah, and like we and they've been working really closely with those WPI Lib people, and like, uh, like we've got. Uh, projects like Photon Vision that are like basing stuff off of the the base Pi images that we provide, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, and the, the hardware people like the I've seen some of their uh, schematics. They actually know what they're doing, you know. Yeah, it certainly seems like a solid little design. Um, I'm I'm impressed. So, and it's I. Yeah, go ahead. Tyler. I was going to say something I just want to ask is, you know, obviously these are all in comparison to the limelight, right? Limelight's kind of the oh, gold yeah. standard that's out there for things. So, you know, as, as somebody like like me, once again, who doesn't, you know, have the, the true understanding of what goes into this, other than cost, is, you know, is there any other major advantage to what this is? Or is there anything that maybe this might not provide that a limelight would? You know, for me, that's a tough question. I, I think there's a lot of unknowns at the moment. What I'll say is that I think the FRC community has the capability of way outpacing what the limelight is capable of as a group of people. Um, and that's not knocking the limelight. Like I, I have a ton of respect for the guys behind that and Brandon and crew that have put tons and tons of energy and effort into it. They solved a problem that I think all of us were trying to solve for a long time. Um, but I'm excited to see competition. Uh, competition drives innovation in my mind. So that to me is really what's exciting about this. Um, I, I, this is a bit unknown at the moment. Like they don't have an actual product yet. We know it's that's, coming. That's we, know they're, we know they're, they're, they're moving on it. Like if I needed a vision system mm-hmm. tomorrow, I'd go buy a limelight um, what, if I had the money. What was the other so, one that came out recently uh, the, sometime this season as well? There was, a, there was a lower cost point one that came out. Um, I don't know specific to FRC. The Javois uh, a couple years ago was the big one that I was excited about. I still am. Uh, 971 has used them very, ex- well, they did use them extensively uh, for some of their stuff. Um, and I think there's a few others that are out there, kind of basic things. Sure. Uh, I'm more excited, and I have many of them sitting on my desk at the moment, of these things. Uh, this is an NVIDIA Jetson Nano. Uh, I have many upon many sitting on my desk <laughs> in fact that's like two of many don't more. rob mason's house um, anybody so or marshall's yeah. house sorry yeah b- that basically uh so uh, photon vision somebody mentioned in the chat it looks like in the chameleon vision those are the software products uh that are going to run on top of the hardware um i don't know i'm really excited for the space i think it's evolving and things are starting to come like now uh very quickly 
So I'm very excited about that. Uh, just want to read a comment from the unofficial fourth says that I think the major uh, thing that this product needs to be very successful is the same ease of integration of the limelight. The documentation is very straightforward and can be started by students who have never done programming before, or, you know, 34 year olds who've never done it before, apparently. So, uh, so is that, you know, for Tyler and Marshall, is that something that you would also look forward into something like that? Or is it like, Hey, I, I have enough level of competency where that wouldn't really matter. Um, for, I, I, I tell you what, Tyler, why don't you go first with this one? How's that? Okay. Uh, what do you think? So I think lo making it as easy as possible is definitely important, and not just for the rookies, but for the experienced people too. Because for a lot of people, like the reason people pick Limelight is because their time is worth more than their money, right? And so they have $400 to spend. They just want something that works, mm. right? And I, so I think, I think that there is definitely a market for something that's super easy to use at a, a good price point. Like that actually integrates, you know, H.264 streaming and like has a built-in camera with some built-in pipelines and some nice configurability in the UI. So you don't have to root around in a command line to get it to work. Uh, hang on. Uh, anyway, uh, somebody's messaging me with a question. I'm trying to figure out what they're actually asking about. So, in fact, it's one of your fellow WPI Lib developers. So... Um, let's see, uh, what do I want to, I want to, I want to comment that, uh, for us, we've, we've long been, uh, we've known of the limelight. We've helped a few teams with using them. Uh, we did some, uh, beta alpha testing for them, um, that I'm proud that we were a part of and, and got to help with that. Uh, I think that the system's awesome. I think that the ease of use for the limelight is key to the market that they've been in. Um, my hope is that the community comes together to make this easy to use. Uh, it seems like they're coalescing around something right now, which I think is tremendous. Having that open platform and making it easy to use are things that are compatible and I think can work well together. Um, my hope is that they are going to make this just as easy as the limelight is to use. Um, I know, I don't know, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about that, but I think WPI Live is making some changes to maybe allow vendors to bring these kind of vision systems in and make it a little bit easier to do the integration for teams. Um, I don't know how much of that uh, we can go into, but Tyler, if you want to comment or not, I don't know. I don't want to put you in a weird spot. Well, I know at least for the publicly, the, the public libraries, we have been working on build, uh, improving the infrastructure in CS Core. Mm -hmm. So that like the streaming is built in so that a lot of these vision solutions can just hook into that instead of having to write their own pipeline from the ground up. Yeah, it's awesome. It looks like in the chat they're talking about uh, making uh, the vision system uh, for uh, Photon Vision uh, integrated with Glowworm, so which I think is awesome. So somebody's suggesting full field localization with six limelights. I'm going to tell you that <laughs> you can do full field localization with no limelights uh which is yeah what we're doing so that's right i don't i don't need a limelight um same here that's so, what my team's doing uh you you can uh make these things work i'm a big fan of teams trying new stuff um i think that the limelight and the glowworm need to exist in the frc ecosystem for teams to be com uh just have them on the i don't uh, okay yeah like raise the competitive floor. yeah sorry uh, yes, uh, I think we need to raise the competitive floor. I'm excited most often by people doing new stuff. Um, that's kind of where I look at things. Uh, teams who are looking at the Intel RealSense uh, systems and looking at other stereo stereoscopic vision systems, things like that are very exciting to me. Um, I'm super, super excited for the, the possibilities that are coming. So that's what I'll say. Uh, I think there's a lot of really cool things that are going on in the space right now, and people are starting to realize it. Um, I'm also really excited because I think, I, I don't know anything for certain, but I believe that the folks at first are starting to look more seriously at things like April tags, um, which it's obviously named after the famous April Redette from NI. Uh, uh, but I think. You hear that, that April? Uh, You're famous now. She's. Totally fine. She's going to be angry at me now. <laughs> um, no, uh, I think that the first is finally starting to look at alternatives to the vision tape systems. And as a result, I think we're going to see teams that are going to start to do localization off of targets on the field. Um, I think it's coming. I don't know when. I have no insider knowledge whatsoever. In fact, if I did, 
uh, somebody at headquarters would probably scream at me for talking about it even. Hey, you're not a first um, employee. It's okay. No. So. But I don't have any insider knowledge. I just think it's coming. I think the technology is finally there, and it's finally being developed and looked at seriously. So the glow worm uh, excites me quite a bit. I'm hoping it, it is a sign of more good things to come. I'm hoping they don't stop with glow worm one. I hope we get a glow worm two or maybe a non glow worm or something. I'm hoping they keep going um, and keep investing energy in the space. I think it's awesome. All right. So let's dive a bit deeper uh, into our next topic here, which is the new potential uh, method or way for FRC events uh, moving forward in 2021. Now, uh, I'm going to preface say that you know, a couple things. One, nothing's been confirmed by by first yet. A lot of these are, are ideas that have either been uh, through some public knowledge or through some other means. Uh, and secondly, nobody knows what's going to happen with COVID, right? And nobody knows what the, uh, specifically for teams in the U.S., uh, what the government's going to do for things and what could be imposed that way. So let's talk about uh, some potential options out there. We're going to start out uh, with some uh, things that, uh, once again, the uh, Chesapeake Peak District posted uh, in their town hall uh, and they actually listed this first HQ FRC one day event concept. So they're saying this is coming from first HQ uh, on this. So want to take a look at some of these on here. And apparently I can't zoom in anymore. Uh, uh, but I'm talking about on here of uh, going to one day events, I think is kind of the main thing. So if you look at kind of these different tier structures or levels uh, that we might have, you know, one of them is going to one day events with Less amount of teams in this case are saying an 18 team limit. Um, there's a couple tier structures for like an 18 or a 10 or less on there uh, of going from there. I want to take these one at a time. And Marshall and Tyler, uh, for those of you on teams, does something like this interest you at all? Would having a one day event with 18 teams uh, and no playoffs is what they're saying for these? And just more of like, hey, we're just going to play some matches, kind of like a league or something like that. Is there interest in that? I mean, for me, it's uh, any opportunity to get out and play. I will caveat that and say I really would like to see this done safely. Um, I have I, I have fears and worries that I think a lot of us have, hopefully, um, that you know we're, we're trying to work this out as best we can. We want to do this safely. So the, the safety of the students and the participants and the volunteers has to be the top priority. Um, if we can achieve that, and do so that you know in a way that we think is uh, going to work for everybody. I'm I'm down. I think it's awesome. I am terrified that they are trying to set some goals in place and not going to be able to find venues for these events. Mm. Um, that's my big worry. So, Tyler, what are your thoughts on this? Tyler, yep. So I agree with that because like if we don't have events, a lot of these teams are going to fold. So they need something to like justify the the, the robot they built. You know. But I do agree that they do need to do it safely. And, would, uh, would we all be in agreement that it is going to be pretty improbable that we're going to have a normal schedule next year at this rate? Extremely. Okay. <laughs> so so with that said, so I think this right here then uh, is what was just suggested is probably the highest tier we might see then right out of the potentials that are out there right now. So let, let's let's kind of go down the rungs a little bit on here. Uh, what if we went to something where it was just uh, uh, one of the concepts was four teams at a time um, with a multi-day event um, where you schedule a co cohort of teams to play um, and playoff scores would be based on district event performance. Uh, so that's, of course, for district area. And one other thing to, to say is just kind of the modified small events concept. So like could you find enough venues for that where it was only a few, like, doesn't matter if you have four or 18 teams for something like that, I guess is really my question because really all that is, is the extra pit space, right? Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that they could condense. I, I don't want them to condense pit space. How do I want to say this? Teams don't have to bring the full contingent of their tools and utilities that they would normally have to bring based on the fact that maybe uh, we've already got robots and things are a little bit more under control than they normally would be. But I don't know. Um, I, I don't even know. Like, I'll be honest with you. North Carolina is one of the smaller districts. I'm curious whether they could get 12 to 18 teams to come to an event right now. Um, I got a feeling the schools are going to say no. And then the local teams might have their own uh, stipulations in place. Uh, parents that are, concerned or don't want this to happen for whatever reason um i i don't know i'm i think there's so many unknowns right now i'm i'm hoping that 
the ideas are good. I think they're reasonable. I, I think it's just, can we secure venues and do so in a way that is safe for everybody to participate? So. One thing uh, uh, I want to get your, your opinion on, Tyler, how you go here first, is that, you know, here in the States, uh, we are much worse off than what many other countries are for things. There are, there are other countries. Now, now realize that 90% of the teams are in the U.S., right? Uh, but if we look at, you know, Canada, Israel, who's actually looking at doing some events in like a month or so, uh, unofficial events, I should say. It's not technically through First Israel. Uh, but you, you look at that. Turkey would be another example that now has over 100 teams on there. Uh, could this be more realistic for uh, perhaps people in, in Canada or somewhere outside of the U.S.? Well, I think definitely for countries that aren't the U.S., because it seems like they've got a much better handle on it and, like, are actually are actually enforcing their social distancing and their safety protocols. Yeah, but so how do you enforce social distancing without getting, I guess, too much in, into that? But, like, you know, you're at a first event. You almost have to have, like, I mean, you, you couldn't have people at the driver stations, right? Is that technically six feet or... Is there breath that's going to hit the polycarb or something like that? Or uh, then again, am I over ambitious that there's going to be a polycarb front panel at a at an event you like have this? To put anyways. them in little boxes. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, for me, I think there's a couple things they're going to have to do. I think they're going to have to do screenings at the doors before people go in yeah. for temperature. Um, and then going beyond that, I think we're going to have to do something where there are zones or something set out to where you know that if you've been in that area, you might have con come in contact with somebody else who was in that same area. Um, and I, I honestly don't know. I, I'm, I think that there are a lot of practical things that are going to have to be implemented for this to be functional. I would kind of look at NASCAR and Formula One for how they're handling it right mm -hmm. now. Um, because I think they're, it, not just from a, a technical perspective, but from a lot of ways they're very similar to the way uh, our events are structured um, with the exception of the fact that I think they are doing some sort of hotel based quarantine for the participants that they're once they're checked in that's it like you're not leaving oh, interesting. Uh, to go somewhere else so you almost if so, you had it at a hotel maybe that could be an option um, because you'd require people to stay on premises yeah. yeah I think that that could be something where they, they require it potentially <laughs> literally book the entire there. hotel I mean you Crazier things have happened. Yeah, that's uh, saying it is it is legitimately so. possible uh, for something like that. Uh, I'm just going to close up. One thing, uh, you know, I for those who watch know that I love Las Vegas a lot. And uh, what not saying this is right or wrong, but just stating what what Vegas casinos are doing, specifically a lot of strip casinos right now, is that they um, temperature screen at the door, like you're talking about, Marshall. They also uh, offer face coverings, but don't require it, which once again are, are those areas, uh, those gray lines that, you know, you could require at a first event for something like that. But that's really about it. If your temperature is over, then they, then they reject you. But uh, I, I really would like to see, you know, what more robust options can be developed out there. And I think things they're going to be telling us, uh, I would say always turn to the NFL and what they're going to be doing uh -huh. uh, for things for us in Green Bay. We've already found out that like our lower level of uh, the Lambeau field is going to be blocked off or parts of the lower level will be, uh, and they're going to require social distancing of X amount of seats between people coming in. Uh, so that'd be interesting to see if there's any way to do that. But then again, you know, you could just say no spectators, I guess, but there's still drive teams who are there that aren't doing anything, which then they're spectating. Right. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. It's it's interesting. All right, last thing I want to wind, round up on here uh, before we jump in uh, tomorrow with Tyler uh, is the concept of doing a skills-based competition. So if you're not familiar with this, uh, 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 VEX does this. Uh, if you're in FTC, uh, the MTI, which is like the IRI version of FTC, uh, did something like this where they essentially had people record uh, their robots performing on the field unobstructed for things and score as many points as possible in a given period of time. How does that, Tyler, how does that sound to you, like in regards to a potential option? Because it, it sounds like it could be much safer, but is that entertaining and is that challenging enough uh, to really provide, you know, a season or even less of the season for something like that? Well, I think we've seen something like that in prior games that didn't have as uh, much of a uh, defense, wasn't as much of a Don't factor. say Recycle Rush. Don't say Recycle Rush. No, I'm sorry. Oh, come on. It's one of my favorite games. Oh, oh. All right. <laughs> Continue, I'm sorry. But yeah, um, but like that's basically what you'd have, right? If it was just skills-based, you wouldn't have any defense because there's no opposition. Yeah. 
Well, so the the advantage to doing something like that, and I think it could be viable, uh, would be if you could find a venue that maybe isn't something that would normally be an FRC venue, uh, so a lot smaller, because you can invite maybe one team at a time and then wipe it down completely, make sure everything's mm. sanitized, you know who's been there, you have ways of tracking that in and out, and then you know you cycle through teams. And is it crappy? Yeah. Uh, it's not what I want. But at the same time, maybe that's what we have to move to for now to survive this. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't hate the idea. I don't like it. But I think these are extraordinary times. So we got to look at alternatives. I, I think the wind up, I think the biggest challenge, and somebody posted this in chat as well too, uh, Boss Checker posted this, is that you know you have to have a venue somewhere for, for things. You have to have a field somewhere because – uh, you know, many of us have been privileged enough to be on teams that can have some sort of field structure or something like that, right? But there are many, many, many thousands of teams that don't have that type of structure for it. So you almost need to find a way to provide that. And there are some areas that have like a, a localized hub where teams can come and do that. But I, I would say that's probably a small fraction, uh, at least in regards to coverage of teams. Uh, out there as well. Um, one thing to interject real quick before we hop into our next topic. If you're interested in playing Take From Fun Trivia and against Tyler here, these are going to be FRC-based questions. They're not all programming questions, uh, but general FRC-based questions. Please shoot first updates now, a private message with your phone number. And if we do pick you to be on air, we'll give you a call for a chance to win $30 if you do beat Tyler. And if Tyler wins, then it goes up to 40 for next time. So no pressure, Tyler, on that. And that'll be coming up uh, after our topic here, diving a bit more into Tyler Marshall. So yeah, uh, I want to get started with an easy one. So how'd you get involved in FRC? Well, my first year in FRC was as a junior in high school. And I did that for two years. And then uh, because I went to the community college that was like just in town, I started mentoring right afterward. And I've been doing that ever since. Cool. And then what made you decide to get involved with contributing to WPI Lib? So that came to mind because... A lot of the stuff we were doing, like on my team at the time, we had to write a lot of these utilities, like the, like the button edge detection kind of things or uh, filters. And I was like, you know, like more teams should have this. We shouldn't have to be writing all of this all the time. And there was a lot of uh, rough edges in WPI Live in the 2011 era because it wasn't like idiomatic C++ or Java. So I was like, you know, we could clean this up. And so then that's some of the first contributions I made was cleaning up the code base and adding new features so that other teams didn't have to do it themselves. Very cool. So uh, we, we hit on the glowworm earlier and kind of the, some of the vision stuff. So I want to jump into something a little more uh, interesting to me. Uh, and it's something that, that I've been dealing with with my team for many years now. And it seems like it's finally starting to get a little more mainstream for everybody. Tell me about simulation. What's going on with WPI now? Uh, where are we headed in, in that direction? So we've been putting a lot of work into simulation for this next year because, like you've seen, like a lot of teams, they barely get times with their robots or time on a field. So we can help alleviate that by letting them simulate their robots, and that could include not just like press a button and make sure your command does what it's supposed to, but also like physics-based simulation. Mm. where you say that my drivetrain has these motors on it with this gear ratio, and then you can drive it around in a simulation GUI. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, do we have any examples of kind of what that looks like? Um... So, uh, well, there is a documentation page uh, yeah. on docs.wplab.org. And then what are kind of, it, it, as you guys are going through this with uh, kind of adding more of that there, What's being worked on? What are the example kind of mechanisms and things you guys are envisioning that, that this is useful for? So, well, I'm envisioning like uh, teams should be able to take their code that they have, not have to modify their teleop or autonomous code. Mm -hmm. Like they just stick some code in a simulation periodic function that says, here is my drivetrain sim object, here's my elevator sim object, and then this input goes to this motor controller, this output goes to this encoder, and mm -hmm. then it just works. Very cool. And they're producing, it looks like we've got some graphs. Uh, are they, is it possible to, to, to make those from this? Is that the idea? Like we're heading in that that's, direction? That's the goal. Because uh, cool. one of the big issues when you have simulation is like controller tuning. 
mm-hmm. and like having enough information to make informed decisions on what's actually going wrong with the robot. So, so we, yeah, good. So one of the things we're working on in parallel is like developing lo- a logging like facility, and the one you in this the in these pictures is uh, the one that my team uses because we home grew some Python to do the plotting. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, so, so we're looking at adding simulation. We're looking at adding, which is kind of already there to an extent, um, and yeah. we're adding uh, the ability to do logging as well. So that's coming. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, is there a particular format you guys are using for the logs? So I don't think we've decided on that quite yet. Like we do have some logging stuff in, like some pull requests, mm-hmm. stuff like high speed logging. So like we split it out to each of the files, and then like the, the way that the my team's logger works is you just dump all the data to each file, and then if as long as it's in a, a stable format, you just grab the data columns you need and group them together. So I'm curious, have you guys? I don't know how how are you doing like from a practical standpoint? How are you doing the logging? Is it being written directly i'm assuming you're not accessing the file system on the rio directly you're either dump into a flash drive or dump oh, actually, actually we elsewhere. are oh really we have scripts for grabbing the, the files off the rio as well oh interesting okay using scp and you guys have found that uh you found writing to it fast enough i'm kind of curious yeah interesting okay because we've got we got like four controllers running at 200 hertz and we haven't noticed any issues huh Maybe I, it's a single we... house versus java thing uh, maybe we're a C plus plus group, but it's hmm. uh, we. I mean, we're not doing natural things with the Robo Rio, so <laughs> let's be clear. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I'm curious. It, it seems like we've had a lot of issues with trying to write files directly to it um, and read things from it. it. The file system can be a little sluggish at times. Um, file I/O has been a, an issue for us, but if it's working, that's awesome. I know for most teams, it's not an issue. Uh, for us, it's different. But yeah, you, well, you might be logging a whole lot of stuff because you use Ross. No, we would never do that. So uh, we've we've found ways around it, though. So, um, so uh, tell me about other advancements with WPL that are coming. What what else is going on? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, we're working on H two sixty four support because we we have MJPEG at the moment. That's what all the camera streams use, but. We don't have enough bandwidth for that, to be honest. We'd have two cameras going at once. I know my team sure doesn't. So we're adding that, and that's going to be built in to a lot like the FRC vision image and that sort of thing. We're also going to have uh, that we redid the FRC characterization UI because last year, like it lets, uh, if you don't know what that is, it's, it lets you run your robot back and forth a couple times and collects data mm-hmm. and then lets you auto tune your, your feedback controllers. Something I want to ask uh, and got asked in chat is, you know, everything we talked about so far, this is FRC, right? Is there anything that might be coming for FTC teams? And specifically, there was a question uh, asked in regards to uh, if there can be a format that FTC teams can import data into. Well, we haven't focused on FTC too much. We do want to expand to FTC because, like, I've talked to some FTC teams on the Discord and they kind of do their own thing. They definitely have their own culture there too, like mm-hmm. of building their own thing because their standard library is like not as comprehensive, shall we say. But um, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't realize that FTC. I I guess in my head I had kind of assumed they were using some WBI lib derivative, but well, I guess actually, it sounds they like they're not. They their controllers control systems a lot more locked down. Yeah. So they run on Android phones, and uh, a lot of their control I/O goes like across like Ethernet or something. Mm-hmm. But like it's definitely not like the real-time control that FRC has. Yeah. Like there, there's significant delays involved, and that so a lot of them will use like this like onboard PID on these separate boards because the I/O is just not fast enough otherwise. Interesting. Okay. Um, so I've got uh, I've got one more question that I, I'm dying to know the answer to. Uh, of all the things that you've contributed to kind of the, the work you've done with WPI, what's the thing you're most proud of that you're hoping to kind of continue to see grow and, and change? Well, I'm definitely liking the new APIs that we've had because that in the 2008 era, mm-hmm. we had a lot of like very 
2008 Java type APIs, where it's like very abstracted and very mm -hmm. object oriented. Now we're, we're moving more towards functional programming and like you make an object and you do the plumbing and it's usually only like, you know, five lines of code anyway, but it mm -hmm. makes the library internals really nice to maintain as well. And it's so, pretty straightforward to use. Very cool. Yeah. I, I understand there's some changes coming to the, or I'd say changes. There's some restructuring going on at the lower levels with the how right now as well to yep. resolve some of the things. I know one of my co-mentors wanted me to ask about the sendable and everything inheriting from it. So um, yeah, I'm not sensible as a oh, we go on for that, about that. <laughs> like I've rewritten it like three times in the last couple of years. I'm hoping we don't have to call it quite as much as we have been. Um, I know that right now we're doing that in a few places. It'd be nice not to. We're we're looking at some other ways to solve that for us as well, but that's us, not everybody. Mm -hmm. So please, for the love of God, nobody else do what Team 900 does. Um, <laughs> So, um, so Tyler, looking yeah. looking to the future for things, uh, you know, for somebody who is uh, going to the site, what are maybe some key things they can pull out of the site, especially for those who are maybe new to uh, programming or, or WPI Lib in general? Uh, what are like some key things you're like, hey, you know, if this is your first time, these are the things I, I suggest that you digest immediately. Well, I would say know your know what hardware you have. You know, you got your rubber rail, your motor controllers, how you actually hook them up. Like, because we have documentation for that, but a lot of teams just skip through it and skim it. And then they're surprised when, like, they didn't tighten down their battery enough and then it flies out of the robot or something. Or, uh, like, and also, there's a lot of the code you need to write is not as complex as a lot of teams make it out to be. Like, if you, a lot of teams, they just need a drivetrain that moves and, like, an arm that manually moves with a joystick. And like that you can do in like, you know, 20 lines of code. So definitely focus on the logic of what you're writing before you write the code. Like if you can describe it in English, you can probably write it in soft, in uh, like a language like Java. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think I'd love to see, and it seems like we're heading in that direction where we're getting more documentation at that level to get teams kind of hooked in. Um, I think people approach programming and they're kind of immediately hit with this sense of dread and fear at all of the things they don't know. And yeah. they're, it can be very intimidating. I mean, honestly, it, it is. is. Yeah. It's like I, learning a foreign language, right? Yeah. I mean, effectively it is. So, uh, yeah. and, and then you look at stuff like I, I, the reason I make jokes about not doing what we're doing, we don't just teach programming to students. We spend a lot of time teaching basic Linux skills because that's what we rely on for a lot of what we're doing. You don't need to know that to program an FRC robot, to be clear. Like, it's helpful at times, but it's not a requirement. Um, I, I have to hand it to the WPI folks who've gone way above and beyond in trying to get a lot of this stuff easier to use for teams. Um, and it just, every year, I think it keeps getting a little bit better and a little bit better at getting easier to use and resolving underlying things and kind of moving it forward. So, um, no, it's impressive work. Um, so the documentation, any particular favorite parts? Well, um, I like the, well, because I'm a controls guy, I like the trajectory generation stuff, but for the average team, they should be looking at like the, like the basic stuff, like how do you drive a robot around the, the filtering stuff is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, we're, 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 we're working on the whole flow through the documentation, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you get dumped on the first page and it's like, well, what is the critical path to go from nothing to a robot that's moving around on a field? Yeah, I think that's been something I, I'd like to see improved. And it sounds like we're heading in that direction of how do you go from kit of parts to making something drive? Yeah, um, that we've, been, we've been pushing for that the last couple of weeks because like we saw... Uh, someone on Chief Delphi posting, you know, because you see teams posting these like getting started guides, yeah. and they're they're always like focused on just what the teams need, but it's not peer reviewed, you know. But so we want to have something like that, but in the official documentation. Yeah, no, I think that's a good. I, I think it would be great to have that. I absolutely, I'd love to see it even go further to include some sample mechanisms. I feel like mm -hmm. there's always a need for here's how you do this thing and put a limit switch on it. Um, and 
I, stuff like that. I think a lot of teams that get started, at least from the the rookie teams we've we've been mentoring over the years, they don't always know that you need an encoder or how to use an encoder. They don't always know that you need a limit switch to prevent the thing from jamming in the first place. So they tend to rely on very basic code instead of trying to get to a point where it's somewhat automated. So I'd, I'd love to see more of that. I think that's awesome that maybe we're heading in that direction. Yeah, well, I think there is a line there, too, because yeah. there, between saying here's the things that you can do and, like, all the possibilities versus here's some code, copy-paste it to your robot, and it'll work. Yeah, yeah I, there is, I, I think there's definitely, you don't want to go too far to give them all of the answers, but... I think making it easier for everybody is probably a good thing. And yes, I don't like an, like an, and in my mind, like an elevator is a very basic example of something that even if you have an elevator, you still don't know what you're elevating. You don't know what the game piece is or the mechanics of whatever are the heights are or any of that. But the programming right. is one of those idioms that you need to know. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I think that that could be useful. What so. about going from an advanced level for teams? So you have teams that understand, you know, they're like, hey, you know, I'm a mid-level team. What do you see between some of the top tier teams out there that they are doing or doing well that maybe some of those like tier three teams aren't quite uh, recognizing or doing in the right way? I think the big thing is the organization they have, mm-hmm. because you can have like know all these different features of your programming language, but if you don't have a good process for turning out high quality software, that's going to be your major limiting factor. Yeah. So can you give me an example of something like that? Well, like, uh, like a, a lot of the code that my, my students write, because they haven't been doing FRC as long, like it helps to have peer reviews and like actually use version control mm. to, ma- to manage your code because if something breaks, you can roll back or uh, making sure that you test your robot code before you merge it into the main branch, uh, like the main working copy. And having discipline, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that's key. I think the other thing that I've, when we talk to teams, one of the things that they don't often realize, we don't jump straight into programming, even if we had a robot, which nine times out of 10, we don't. We spend a a lot more time talking about what the design and architecture of the underlying system is and how we want it to function. Um, I think if you're a mid-tier team and you're looking to move into that next level, you want to spend a lot of time researching not just conversion control and how to kind of use that to the best of your ability, but I think you want to spend a lot more time talking about your robot architecture and the framework that you're using and what it needs to look like to be successful um, and spend you know, two days up front doing that rather than jumping straight into programming. Unless you've got it something that you're very comfortable with already and you just want to extend it. But even then going back and revisiting it, um, the the rule of thumb for industry is that code gets outdated in about two years and you want to revisit it and look at what it's doing and whether it's still fulfilling the purpose you need. So yeah, no, I completely agree. Organization's the, the big one. It's not even programming. It's a people problem at that point. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Tyler, for that. Of course, if you have more questions, uh, Tyler, they can find you. I see all over the FRC uh, Discord. Is that the preferred way to get in contact with you, or how else can people get in touch? That's probably the easiest way. All right, for sure. So take a look for Tyler on that. And uh, before we wrap up today, we are going to be starting, of course, our trivia for $30 against Tyler. This is your opportunity once again. um, We do have uh, a few people in queue, so if you did not get a private message from me, uh, we probably won't be calling you, but we're going to be calling. uh, Let's take a look and see if we can get a hold of some people. Uh, And then I'll explain how trivia works in just a moment as well, too. So we'll call our first person here. And Marshall, I'm hoping that you can hear this as it comes through because I'll need you, I to doc- need you to document the answers as they come through. All right, I got so. it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I am documenting it. Hello. Hello. Hey, who's this? This is Jesse. Hey, Jesse. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. This is Tyler from First Updates Now. You ready to play some trivia? <laughs> I'll, I'll bump it up to $40 for somebody. All right. Fair, fair enough. And Jesse, what team are you from? Oh, can you turn off your uh, your stream if you don't mind, Jesse? And what team are you from? <laughs> team Yup, huh? What are you on FRC, FTC? What you on, man? Jesse, are you there? Yep. What what team are you on? Uh, actually, I've talked to you before. I'm from Northern 
Minnesota. I'm with team 3134 and 3275. All right, man. Awesome. Yeah, I got you here. So, all right. So, Jesse, uh, here's how it's going to work. We're going to have uh, five questions for you to uh, go through. Uh, once we're going to get started, we're actually going to have Tyler take off his headphones so he can't hear the questions to go through. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to either answer the question or pass, which we will come back to that question. Uh, just one time, though, if you pass again, that's the answer that we take. Uh, for this uh, our tiebreaker is time so you do have to go as quick as possible none of that google stuff in the background we know if you do that all right so uh tyler or uh jesse are you ready i think so all right my, so my tyler mouth. we're gonna have you take off your headphones there or yeah. mute one of the two and we'll we'll give tyler a big wave once we're ready to go all right jesse your time begins in three two one in what year did first start to the two championship system What are the three programming languages supported by the Robo Rio and allowed in FRC? Java, LabVIEW, and C++. Name one of the two teams who were entered into the Hall of Fame with the Championship Chairman's Award in 2019. Uh, Green Machine. What was the inaugural season of first in FRC? 1992. And we're going to take the closest guess on this. How many millions of dollars in scholarships did FIRST advertise as being available in the 2020 season? 15 million. In time. All right. How'd you feel you did? Uh, I know I got the first one wrong. Can I re-answer that? No, you can't. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We'll bring Tyler back in and uh, get him to get his headphones back on here. We're going to put you on hold for just a second here. All right. Tyler? Point at him. Yeah. He's not looking anymore. We'll, we'll message him on. We'll message Turned him. Away. Come back. <laughs> Come back, Tyler. There you go. I think he saw it now. There we so. go. <laughs> All right. Tyler, Jesse felt he did pretty good. So we'll uh, give you your opportunity here. And uh, we'll see how you do. Are you ready? I hope so. All right. Time begins in three, two, one. Uh, what year did first start the two championship system? Uh, 2014. What are the three programming languages supported by the Rubble Rio and allowed in FRC? C++, Java, and LabVIEW. Name one of the two teams who were entered into the Hall of Fame with the Championship Chairman's Award in 2019. Ooh. I don't have a clue for that one. <laughs> All right. What was the inaugural season of FIRST or FRC? 1998. And we'll take the closest guess. How many millions of dollars in scholarships did first advertise as being available in the 2020 season? 14 million. In time. All right, we'll go through these one by one. We're going to bring back uh, Jesse here once again. And uh, we'll go through these, like I said, one by one. First question on here. In what year did first start the two championship system? Jesse said 20 or 2004. Tyler said 2014. The correct answer was 2017. I thought you guys were going to get that one. Um, all right. So what are the three programming languages supported by the Robo Rio and allowed in FRC? Uh, Jesse said Java, LabVIEW, and C++. Tyler said the same thing. That is both correct. 1-1 one, one, as we go through here. Name one of the two teams that were entered into the Hall of Fame with the Championship Chairman's Award in 2019. Uh, Tyler said, I don't know, which is in the past. So we can't go back to it. And uh, Jesse said, Green Machine. Green Machine is correct. The other team, 1860, or 1902, I'm sorry, exploding bacon. Uh, two to one for Jesse. What was the inaugural season of first or FRC? Jesse said 1992. Tyler said 1998. 1992 is correct. Three to one. And rounding it up, what was the, by the closest guess, how many millions of dollars did first advertising be available in the 2020 season? Jesse said 15 million. Tyler said 14 million. It's actually 80 million dollars available in scholarships. I know Michelle Long will love hearing that. Uh, that means Foghorn there. Jesse, you are our winner. Congratulations. You take this one four to one. Anything to say on your big win here today? Uh, I, guess I have no comment. 
it was uh it was a pleasure playing <laughs> all right fair enough uh go ahead and shoot me a message on discord we'll get that uh money sent over to you that does mean that we'll reset back down and congratulations uh to jesse uh for the big win on there uh so thank you so much everybody for tuning in uh we're gonna be wrapping up this show tyler thank you so much for taking the time uh to go through everything from the headlines to our discussions to of course talking about more about w wpi lib and in the time you dedicate towards that because i'm guessing that's a lot of volunteer time that you guys uh put into this uh anything to wrap up with or anything that you'd like people to check out or, or check out uh in the future in regards to wpi lib or anything else with your team well uh definitely check out the blog within the next couple months because we're going to be pushing out some new stuff soon and uh yeah and i guess you could watch the some of our github repositories because a lot of traffic goes through there so if you're interested in contributing just jump in and ask and like uh ping me on discord if you want to get involved awesome man and marshall thank you once again for coming on of course a great co-host here on fun and you can catch him of course in our uh southeast uh show that we have the uh, not mouth of the south sweet tea region recap uh, (laughs) on as well of course he co-hosts a few other ones so uh marshall anything to wrap up with you here today no, I need a nap. That's all I get. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give Marshall a big shout out since the first time he's on air. Marshall's a new dad. Uh, so congratulations once again uh, on that. I'm sure you're exhausted uh, beyond belief as somebody who has a seven-month-year-old uh, myself. Uh, but congratulations, man. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, don't forget, uh, thank you once again to everybody who helps support the stream. We rely on your contributions to keep fun, loud, live, and independent. Uh, so thank you so much to those who did subscribe uh, or follow or bits or any of that. All of it goes to be a big help uh, through here. So thank you so much to those who did contribute and, and, and chip in. It really does mean a lot to us to be able to keep creating content like this here for you. Uh, don't forget to check out our Discord, discord.gg forward slash first updates now. Uh, and you can check us out, of course, on all the social medias, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Sorry, not twi- not TikTok yet. We'll get into that at some point. Uh, but, and of course, uh, uh, Chief Delphi, the Discords, all that stuff as well. We also have FTC content uh, coming at you as well if you're into that. Uh, next show's coming up. We actually have on Friday uh, the uh, Inspire NC CAD Challenge uh, will be happening on Friday starting at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern. We have both FTC and FRC uh, submissions will be going over, so lots of cool stuff with that. Uh, and then on Saturday, we actually have a Rocket League tournament. So if you're interested, you play some Rocket League. It does not matter how good you are. Trust me, I'm terrible. Uh, go ahead and join that. You can find out more information on that on our Discord starting at 3 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. You need to sign up by Friday. Um, and then we'll be back next Tuesday with FRC Recap Weekly. So on speaking of behalf of myself, Tyler, and Marshall, and uh, everybody else, uh, all the moderators working hard behind the scenes. We appreciate you tuning in. We'll see you next time on Fun. Talk to you then. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.